This morning uh, we are in Matthew chapter 10, and um, if, if I did communicate this correctly to uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, Internet uh, Ministries crew, we should be looking at verses 32, reading verses 32 through, let, what is it, 42. In other words, the second half of the chapter. Uh, but we are going to be focusing primarily on verses 32 and 33, which are the first two verses of what I'm going to read now. So let's listen carefully to this, again, remembering that this isn't just something Matthew thought was a good idea to write down. This is God's Word. He says, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the enemies of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this morning. Now we've been looking at the subjects of what it is that God looks for when He looks throughout the world. What is He searching for? Well, I think we've seen that He is looking for somebody who is committed to Him, somebody who is committed to His cause, somebody who is seeking for the glory and the honor and the riches that come from Him and not those that the world has to give. Now, this kind of heart, as we've already seen, expresses itself in many different ways, not the least of which is the desire to please God with your whole life. I think that's what um, Jesus was summarizing when one of the scribes asked him what the greatest commandment is in the law, and he says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul all your strength. That is a desire to love and please God with everything with which you have to do it. And of course, the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, to love and minister to your neighbor in the way that you would someone minister to you. Now, our theme today focuses on how we can actually do both of these things at the same time, and that is by confessing Jesus to others, confessing that we know Him, confessing that we love Him, that that we believe Him, we believe His gospel, we know that He is the only way of salvation, not only for us, but also for them. And I hope you can see that when we do this, that we're not only loving and honoring the Lord who actually redeemed us for this purpose, but also loving our neighbor because we're sharing with them the only message that can save their lives from something that's far worse than anything that could happen to them in this world. So this morning, let's consider three things from this passage. I want us to consider the the context. We realize that Jesus gives these commands to His 12 disciples, sends them out to preach. There are certain things in here that apply to them that don't apply to us, so we want to see what applies to us and what doesn't. Secondly, one thing we do want to see applies is that we do need to confess Jesus, what it means to do that. And then thirdly, <clears throat> what the Lord promises to do, what He's already done to help us, to encourage us to do this. 
So first of all, let's consider the context. Uh, Jesus obviously here is calling His 12 disciples and equipping them to do a particular work. And by the way, I want you to notice that that includes Judas. Uh, Judas was the recipient of the ability to do these things as well as the call, which means that even an unconverted person can do this. Now, again, Judas received things from the Lord that not everybody is necessarily going to receive, but because he did, he was also much more blamable when he denied the Lord. But what does Jesus do to equip His 12 disciples? Well, first of all, He gives them His Spirit, His Spirit to give them the power to proclaim Jesus Christ and to cast out demons, to do particular miracles, casting out demons, healing every sickness, even raising the dead. In other words, to do a series of showstoppers, we might call them, crowd-stopping miracles, to get them to stop and pay attention to the message so that they will listen. He sends them out, secondly, not to the Gentiles, not to the Samaritans, but only to the Jews. And that was because this blessing was a blessing God had promised to the Jews first. I mean, this is the fulfillment of all of His promises to them, the fulfillment of the promises to their fathers. They were to have the privilege of hearing the gospel first before anyone else receives it. By the way, that's why we see in the book of Acts when they go out to preach, they, Jesus told them to go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. That's why they did that. That doesn't mean that today we have to do that, but it does mean in those days they had to do that because Israel had to hear it first. Jesus told them they were not to take anything with them, uh, no extra money, no extra clothes, bags, staff, even food, just the clothes that they were wearing because Jesus wanted them to be supported by the work that they were doing, basically by those who heard the gospel and received it. If a city or town didn't receive their message, they were to shake the dust off of their feet as a testimony against them. And we say, well, that sounds rather harsh, but realize that they were bringing to Israel the message of the fulfillment of all the promises that God had made to them. If they reject that, the best news that God could possibly ever give, He says it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, that, that we see that recurring theme, don't we, through the Gospels. If you reject the Gospel, that's a worse crime, it's a worse sin than what Sodom and Gomorrah was doing, which, as you know, are cities that were destroyed in God's wrath because of the sins they were committing of homosexuality. So there I said it. Now, you know, today that's not, it's not in vogue to say that because, you know, you're, you're going to be labeled as, as being hateful, but that's not hateful to point out the truth. This is what the Bible says. And those who practice that are under His judgment. But I want you to notice this. Those who reject the gospel are going to be even under worse judgment than that. Okay, so there is a sin that is worse, and that is hearing the gospel and rejecting that. As you know, again, everyone who, who doesn't trust in Jesus is going to end up perishing. Now, Jesus also warns them that there would be many who reject them, that they would be like sheep among wolves. They would be arrested, brought before governors and kings. They would be handed over to the courts and scourged in the synagogues because of Jesus and His gospel. In other words, people aren't going to shake their hands and welcome them into their houses. It's not going to be an easy road for them. Although some people would receive Him, many would not. So they had to be ready for that. They would even be betrayed by their own families, by their closest relatives. They would be handed over to death, hated by everyone because the audience that He was sending them out to preach the gospel to were already predisposed against Jesus Christ. They already hated Him. So this is the kind of perception that they could expect. It didn't sound like a very easy road. But notice Jesus also encouraged them. He told them, first of all, they shouldn't be afraid because those that they're going to speak with, though they might have this particular predisposition, they might hate you, they might scourge you, they might kill you, but that's all they can do. 
They can't touch your soul. And that's the most important part. That's something God is reserving for Himself. If those they preached to rejected their message, the Father would destroy them in His judgment, their body and their soul. By the way, we can't miss the implication here that Jesus was also saying to them throughout this chapter that if you should ever deny me to save your life, if you should ever deny me to save your relationships or to hold on to anything you think is more precious than than Jesus, well, then you need to fear God because you would face Him then as a judge. You, you can't deny Jesus Christ and you cannot set Him aside because of something that's more precious. He must be the most precious. But don't fear those who can destroy only the body but can't touch the soul. Rather, fear Him who has authority to destroy both body and soul in heaven. The Puritans used to say, one fear cures another. If you fear God enough, you will not fear man. Secondly, Jesus wanted them to know that the Father truly does love them and He was watching over them for good and that He would keep them. Even a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground apart from your Father, He says. He even knows the number of hairs on your, on your head. The Lord is very much aware of us. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're doing. He knows what we have to endure. And if a sparrow, which is really worthless, can fall, it really can't fall to the ground apart from your father's knowledge, he says, how much more will he watch over you? How much more will he guard you? Because you are of much more value, he says, than many sparrows. So Jesus was assuring his disciples of the father's love for them. But I want you to notice here again, and I hope you saw that through Matthew chapter 10, those, those two motivations again, the, the idea of the love of God and the fear of God. They're repeated throughout the New Testament. They're certainly repeated throughout the Old Testament. That's something that doesn't change. And we see that as well in the comments that he makes next in verses 32 and 33. If you confess me before men... I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Again, the encouragement of love and the encouragement of fear, both very present. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, some of these things really only applied to them, and some of them still apply to us. Now, what applies only to them was the fact that God had entrusted to them the, the authority to work miracles. It would be nice to be able to do that today, but He hasn't given us that authority because His Word is already established. The fact that they should go only to the Jews, that's not something that applies to us. We are to go to everyone. Some of these only applied to their office, that they should publicly preach the gospel. That's not something that all of us are called to do. Or that they should receive their support from the work of the gospel. That applied to their office. But some of these things still do apply to us today. We are the ones who are called to bring the gospel to others. The Lord still gives us His Holy Spirit to empower us to be His witnesses we are still sheep among wolves, which means that we are going to be hated as Jesus was hated. And the motives still apply, the two motives. Love, if you confess me before men, Jesus says, I will confess you before the Father. And fear, if you deny me, I will deny you. It's also true, by the way, for those who are blessed enough to hear the gospel but they reject it. It's still going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for them. Now, to our point, what is it that this passage tells us about what the Lord is looking for when He looks throughout the earth? Well, He's looking for those who are willing to confess Him in the power of His Holy Spirit even though it means you will be hated by the world. And it is true. You will be hated by the world. Well, that's what he's looking for. Well, since this is what he's looking for, let's consider secondly what it means. What does it mean to confess Jesus Christ before men? 
Well, it means simply to declare publicly what you believe to be true. I mean, consider what Jesus was sending His disciples to do. He was sending them to tell others that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Sort of a um, shorthand way of saying Messiah was here, that it was time to repent and put their trust in Him, receive Him as the Messiah, and begin to follow Him. Now, they were only responsible to confess Him, to declare who He was and what, what it is that they needed to do, which was repent and believe. They weren't responsible for how the message was received, but only that they communicated. I and mean, Jesus actually told them in advance how they were going to respond to it. And for the most part, they weren't going to respond well. Well, now that the 12 apostles are gone and even the 70 that Jesus sent out on another occasion, and uh, to whom does this responsibility fall? Well, it really falls upon us as a church. Thankfully, not just upon this small body of believers, this small fellowship, but the church as a whole. It's our responsibility to get this message out, but let's not forget that responsibility includes you, it includes me. Peter tells us that we really need to be ready at all times to be able to give a reason for the hope that we have. Yet, he says, with meekness, with gentleness, and with reverence. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, when you talk with unbelievers, you know, you spend time around them, you try to build those bridges and so forth. Have you ever noticed that they don't have any problem at all telling you what they believe? Have you ever noticed that? I mean, that, that happens all the time, doesn't it? They tell you exactly what they believe, and they tell you that because they think you should believe it too, and especially in today's society that doesn't want us just to tolerate what somebody might believe, what they might think is good and right. They, they want you to accept it. They don't have any problem telling us these things, confessing what they believe, but yet when it comes to confessing the gospel, we have a difficult time because we understand that just about everything is not only tolerated but accepted in our society but this. And so we're going to be tempted not to be as forward as other people with what we believe. It shouldn't be that way, but often we are tempted not to tell others what we believe because we are sheep among wolves. We are lights that shine in a dark place, and the darkness does not like the light. We are in enemy territory. They are in their own territory. And all these things mean they're not going to like what we have to say. And so we're tempted not to speak. We also know that once we identify ourselves as Christians, that our lives are immediately going to be put on display. I mean, you live in a glass house after that because they are scrutinizing absolutely everything you say and everything you do, and mainly because they're looking for a reason to discredit you and to discredit Jesus and to discredit everything that you have to tell them about the gospel, which means confessing Jesus becomes even harder because you become, I mean, it, it draws the battle lines immediately as soon as, you, as soon as you say something about it. You're on one side and they're on the other. And we know that it's never easy to have to be separated, to have to be on the outside of any particular group. I mean, we're societal creatures, right? We love to live in society. We like to get along with other people. We, we like to feel like we're, you know, a part. We feel like we want to sense that we're a part of what's going on. But yet, if we declare Christ, if we confess Him, we find ourselves suddenly on the outside of that group. But we do need to realize, even though that's not pleasant, although when we consider what the world's like, it's not something we should lament because to be in that society is only to have our morality corrupted anyway. But remember that Jesus calls us to be on the outside. He tells us quite plainly in 2 Corinthians 6.17 that we must be willing to come out from among them and be separate. And if we are willing to do this, He will be our God and we will be His sons and His daughters. 
If we're going to confess Jesus Christ, we can't be going the same direction as the world. We cannot be indistinct from the world. Otherwise, we really have no message. We do have to stand apart. We do have to be different if we are going to confess Him because it means we have to live like Jesus. We have to be different from the world. Now, it's not easy. Jesus didn't say it would be easy. As a matter of fact, He told His disciples it would be hard. But it is right. It's what the Lord says we must do. And He tells us that it is the only path that actually ends in, in heaven. You realize Pilgrim's Progress, again, the straight and narrow path is not only the path of morality, but as a part of that morality, it means confessing Jesus Christ. Those who are on the path are those who actually are, whether they are genuine Christians or hypocrites. Everyone on the path is confessing Christ and at least outwardly look like they're following Him, living according to His commandments. That's what Jesus calls us to do, and, it, and you'll also remember that that path alone is the one that leads to the celestial city. We do need to confess Him. We do need to follow Him. It's right. It's good. It's the only path that leads to heaven, not because Bunyan put it in his book. It's because that's what the Bible tells us, okay? Now, since this is what Jesus calls us to do, and since we realize it isn't easy, let's consider finally what the Lord has actually done to help us. And there are three things here, I believe, in our text, at least three. First of all, the Lord has given us His Holy Spirit to help us do this. He equipped His disciples with the spirit of boldness. Now, there was one occasion where uh, Peter and John were arrested and they were threatened and they were released. And when they came back to their, to their society, to those who were standing apart from the world with them, and thankfully, you know, when we, when we say we need to stand apart from the world, it does mean that there's another group of people that are doing it with us, and that is our family, that is our society. Well, they came back to their society and they prayed. And they asked the Lord to give them boldness. What we have here is, you know, they were sheep in the midst of wolves. Those wolves threatened them and told them, don't name the name of Christ anymore. Don't preach in His name anymore. And they said, we have to obey God rather than men. They come back to their society. They pray. God sends His Holy Spirit and He gives them the power to confess Jesus Christ boldly in the midst of all that opposition, in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of those wolves, the sheep had the courage to do that, and that's because of the Spirit of God. Now, the Lord tells us that He has given us His Spirit as well. We still have that provision given to us today. Paul writes to Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. We actually have the power we need to confess Jesus Christ boldly. But you know as well as I do that the measure of the Spirit that we have can be greater or less depending upon how we use the means of grace and how we live. And so Paul writes to the Ephesian church and he commands them, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of other things. But instead, be filled with the Spirit of God, with that holy zeal and that holy love which will give you the boldness to love your neighbor enough and to love Christ enough to confess Him before men. Now, Paul would not have commanded that if it were not possible. It was not only possible then, but it, it's possible today. You can be filled with the Spirit of God. And so your obligation, my obligation is to pray for the Spirit to pray to be filled with the Spirit, asking the Lord that He might give us that boldness and that power to do His will. And at the same time, to stay away from the things we know God hates and that quench and grieve the Spirit of God, which takes away that boldness and power. The more we indulge in the things of the world, the more it's going to sap our strength. The less we separate from the world and are not distinct from the world, the more we're going to be weakened by worldly influences because we quench the Spirit. So again, we use the means to get the Spirit and we need to plug those holes up by which we lose that influence. We need to stay away from the world. At the same time, I think we should pray that the Lord would give us opportunities to share His gospel 
with others. And you know what? Um, when we pray for opportunities and we really want to share Christ with others, He will give us those opportunities. He will. When you are ready, He will bring those things into your life. If you're not ready, then those opportunities aren't going to come. So pray to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, that was the first help. But secondly, and these, I told you there were three. The, the, the second are two encouragements that the Lord gives us. Uh, promises, basically. First one is, if you will confess Christ before others, if you will separate yourself, be filled with the Spirit, and tell others about Jesus Christ, He says, He will confess you before the Father. He's going to put you among the sheep, not among the goats. He's going to point you out before His Father and say, that one is mine. He or she belongs to me. I laid down my life for that one. So keep that one for me. Now, I don't know about you, but on the day of judgment, I want Jesus to say that about me. You know, not I, that one. I don't know you, you know. That one is mine. Well, the way that you have Him confess you is by your confessing Him here on the earth, owning Him. If you own Him here, He will own you there. Now, these are not, again, works that we do in order to justify ourselves before the Lord. This is something that we will do, at least in varying degrees, if we are His children, because we have His Holy Spirit. But again, we don't want to just get by. We want to do the very best that we can do. So if you confess Him before men, He will confess you before His Father. And then the, the last one uh, is, is an encouragement as well uh, in, 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 a, in a couple of different ways. If, well, I should say, when you confess Him before others, it means you're not denying Him, right? And when you're not denying Him but you are confessing Him, it does tell you something about your status before the Lord. It means that you belong to Him. As long as you're not denying Him, you are confessing Him. That is part of the evidence that you belong to Him. But of course, there's positive and negative here because it also means if you're not willing to confess Him, but you are act actually distancing yourself from Him uh, when you're around others. And again, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the latter part of, of chapter 10, when Jesus says this, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He's following up on what he has said here with regard to confessing and denying. If, if you would deny Jesus or distance yourself from him in order to hold on to father or mother, in order to have peace in your household, in order to maintain your relationship with your son or your daughter, or even to hold on to your own life. If you would deny Jesus for that, you see, then you're, you don't belong to Him. You know, those who are Jesus, those who belong to Him, are those who will confess Him in varying degrees because they love Him, and they love Him most of all. And they're willing to give up everything. Jesus said on another occasion, we actually have to, by comparison, I believe, hate those who are closest to us in comparison to our love for Him. There shouldn't even be a close second, you see. I have to hold on to Jesus if it means I have to lose father or mother, if it means I have to lose son or daughter, if it means I have to give up my life. I cannot deny Him. I must still confess Him. And I will do that because I love Him. So the fact that I'm confessing Him means that I belong to Him, that that love is present and I'm willing to give up those things which are so precious to me in this world in order to confess Jesus means that I belong to Him. And of course, again, the negative thing here is if, if I am willing to give Him up for these things, even for the world, it means that I don't belong to Him. It means I've traded Him for something that is worthless, really. We can't treat the Lord that way. Now, one thing I do want to mention, as I said before, we do need to understand what Jesus is saying here when He says confess and deny. Uh, denying Him is, 
when he says that, I think he has more in view here than just, you know, if I happen to be silent on an occasion. Although I'm not confessing him, I don't know that, I mean, there is a certain sense in which I should be ashamed. I'm not speaking about him the way that I should. But I don't think he's, he's saying, if you do that to me, that I'm going to be silent when it comes to the day of judgment. Because there are times when we are tempted to do that, times that we are afraid, times when we don't find the strength to be able to confess Him. It doesn't mean that we don't belong to Him necessarily. Joseph of Arimathea, you know, I don't know, every time I read the account of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple of Jesus Christ, who was not willing to confess Him publicly for fear of the Jews, and yet he was willing to go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. He put his, you know, wrist his neck, put his life on the line. Was Joseph of Arimathea a true believer or not? I think he was, but realize that he's not perfect, we're not perfect, sometimes we fail to confess Jesus the way that we should. And if there have been times in your life when you haven't quite found that courage to confess Him, that doesn't mean the Lord is going to disown you. I think what He means, at least what the Word means here, is that if you just outright deny that you know Him, if you deny Him, He's going to deny you. If you disown Him, He's going to disown you. If you renounce Him, He's going to renounce you. Now, again, we have to recognize that there are cases when even true believers can, can buckle under the pressure. I mean, what did Peter do when he was confronted by those three? I think a couple of instances was even a servant girl, although we can't, you know, we don't think, well, it's just a servant girl, big deal. Why, why deny her? Well, she can scream and say, look, here's one of Jesus' disciples, arrest him, you know. I think that's why he was afraid, not just because it was a servant girl, but... He denied that he even knew him. But the kind of denial that he made was not one where he says, you know, I really do not know this man. I mean, he said that, but in his heart, there was a struggle because he really didn't want to do that, but he did it because he buckled under the pressure. He buckled under the fear of what would happen to him if he, if he didn't do that. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. If you become afraid and you happen to do that, it's a shameful thing. It's sin. You shouldn't do it. But it doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. If you downright deny Him all the time and you set Him aside for everything else in your life and say, I want these things more than I want Him, well, you are denying Him. You are disowning Him. You are renouncing Him. But let's just bear in mind here, this doesn't mean that, again, if, you have, if you've ever failed, that He's going to deny you on that day. I mean, the Lord knows our weaknesses. But on the other hand, if you do happen to fall into that category of person who has not confessed Him because you don't want to own Him and you do deny Him because you don't love Him, or you disown Him whenever it's convenient and you always put Him aside when you want to pursue something that you know He really doesn't want you to pursue, you do have to come to grips with the fact that you don't know Him. And if you don't turn from your sin and confess Him and repent of your sin and begin to confess Him and own Him, well, He is going to deny you on that final day. He is going to hand you over for judgment unless you repent. So there are people who do fall into this category. Make sure you're not one of them because judgment is real. Jesus is real and there is a day of reckoning and you do need to be ready for it. But again, getting back to those who struggle, if you really want to own Him, you really want to confess Him, but you're struggling to find the courage to do that, realize that the Lord is not going to disown you, but realize that He has pledged to give you help to do this very thing, to give you the power to confess Him if you're simply willing to ask the Lord and to seek Him for the power to do that. I mean, Jesus wants you to be strong. He wants you to be courageous. That's why He's given you His Holy Spirit and promises to give you more of His Holy Spirit to be able to do what He calls you to do. He doesn't say, here, go do the impossible thing and do the best you can and, you know, you're on your own, tough. No, He says, I am with you. I will help you. I've given you my Spirit. If you need more, ask for more because the Lord wants you to confess Him before men. That's why He saved you. 
And that's why He's willing to give you that strength and that power if you have the kind of heart that is willing to do that for Him. So again, what kind of person is the Lord looking for? He's looking for somebody who isn't ashamed of Him, who isn't ashamed of His gospel, who's willing to stand apart from the world and be separate and willing to confess Him as Lord and Savior, even if it means that you're going to be hated by the world. If you're willing to do this, then you're the kind of person that He looks for as He looks through the world. He's looking for people to use. So let's seek to be the kind of person that He can use. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord would help us to do that and to be that way.